All right, good morning, everybody. My name is Sarah Huber. I'm a water resource control engineer with the Strategic Stormwater Planning Unit in the California State Water Resource Control Board's Division of Water Quality. I will be acting as the facilitator for today's storm seminar. Next slide, please. Because there are so many non-Californian participants on today's call, I wanted to briefly introduce the tr Strategic Stormwater Planning Unit. This unit was formed in 2016 to implement the State Water Board's strategy to optimize resource management of stormwater, or storms for short. Our mission is to lead the evolution of stormwater management in California by advancing the perspective that stormwater is a valuable resource. We support policies for collaborating watershed for collaborative watershed level stormwater management and pollution prevention to help remove obstacles to funding, develop technical resources, and integrate regulatory and non-regulatory interests. The entire STORMS unit is helping me organize this seminar today. The team includes Amanda McGee, our unit chief, Chris Began, Sahand Rastagapur, and Daniel Delgado. Next slide, please. Today's technical program will consist of approximately 90 minutes of presentation time, followed by approximately 30 minutes of Q&A. We invite you to email us questions by using the STORMS email address listed on this slide. Please send emails to storms at waterboards.ca.gov. Daniel Delgado is standing by and tracking the account. We will compile questions in the order of submission. Any questions we are unable to address by the end of the seminar will be compiled and shared with our speakers to be answered directly. This seminar is being live streamed from the State Board website at https video.calepa.ca.gov. This seminar is being recorded, but unfortunately we cannot share the recording until NOAA has pub published the findings at a future date. Next slide, please. So let's get started. The STORM seminar series includes webinars and events like today, accessible open forums that feature new research, technologies, policies, and news relating to stormwater. The opinions expressed in this presentation and on the following slides are solely those of the presenters and not necessarily those of the State Water Board. The State Water Board does not guarantee the accuracy or reliability of the information provided, but we are happy to share this information. Next slide, please. I'd like to introduce our speakers. Jessica London is a National Research Council research scientist working at NOAA Fisheries. She's an ecotoxicologist with a focus on the effects of toxic contaminants on aquatic populations, such as the stormwater, urban stormwater runoff mortality syndrome in salmon. Prior publications that she has published include evaluating the effects effects of toxic contaminants on salmon species and optimizing trace analytical tools to monitor persistent contaminants like PCBs and DDT. Contaminants associated with oil spills like PAHs in large marine mammals, terrestrial animals, and across broad geographic landscapes using SCAT samples. Our second speaker is Nat Schultz. He is a NOAA fisheries research scientist. Nat is a marine zoologist and physiologist with focus on pollution threats to the long-term conservation of NOAA trust species and communities. He leads the ecotoxicology program at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. Current research focus areas include oil spills, urban stormwater, pesticides, metals, and contaminants of emerging concern. Nat, I'd like to turn it over to you and thank you so much for today's presentations. Thank you so much, Sarah, and uh, and thanks everybody for tuning in uh, this morning. Really look conversation and uh, the opportunity. Um, the the presentation that we have for you today is kind of in three sections. The first is going to be uh, kind of a background for the phenomenology of the stormwater related. Now um, your slides disappeared real quick. Oh, they did. You can see Nat's slides. All right, I'm going to go on mute. It looks like we've got confirmation from the EP live, live stream that they can sleep. That they can see them. Okay, great. Um, the, the presentation today is going to have three uh, parts. The first is going to be a setup and, and background information on a 20-year study that we've been doing in and around uh, Greater Puget Sound. 
on stormwater impacts to salmonids. Um, and then Jessica is going to step in and give a, a sort of a data intensive overview of one of the focus areas, which is the land cover and land use to changing water quality across a gradient of urbanization as it relates to, to the health of, of these NOAA trust resources, salmonids. And then uh, I'll come back online after Jessica has presented her slides and talk a little bit about where the science is going. And then we should have at least a half an hour at the end for uh, discussions. So as Sarah mentioned, uh, I head up an ecotoxicology program at the Northwest Science Center in Seattle. Um, we are the research headquarters for NOAA fisheries in the Pacific Northwest. And, and the nature of my program, I'm focusing on, on ocean pollution issues and coastal watershed health, uh, is unique to Seattle as well. So even though our science center is in Seattle, we, we also work on water quality and pollution issues throughout the United States, including California um, and elsewhere. So my team was uh, the lead in some respects for the work on Deepwater Horizon in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, Hurricane Katrina, the Costco Basin oil spill in San Francisco Bay and the like. And so the, the focus today is really on stormwater. Much of the data that you're going to see is, is uh, from field and laboratory work that was done in, in Puget Sound. But the science that we're basically developing is, is intended for natural resource management and salmon conservation activities up and down uh, the West Coast. And like, like everything that we do, uh, it's, a, it's a very large collaboration. Uh, this particular project has had uh, an army of folks that are working with us over the past two decades. Um, the work that I'm showing today predominantly is coming from uh, our group at the Northwest Science Center. Uh, there's a lot of uh, collaborative work with Jen and McIntyre's group in particular at Washington State University at the Washington Stormwater Center. And, and I'll come into that in particular with the green infrastructure uh, focus later. Uh, very important uh, leads at the University of Washington and the Center for Urban Water at Kologia's lab. Um, these folks are experts in analytical chemistry and are leading the charge on the non-target uh, analysis of feature detection for unknown contaminants in stormwater. And so you'll see some of their data as part of this as well. And then long-term collaboration with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, has been instrumental throughout. And then. Uh, the work would not have been possible without financial support, but then also a lot of just on the ground um, collaborative uh, project support from uh, multiple tribal organizations, multiple municipalities, um, state organizations, nonprofits, and others. So it really has been uh, a big effort over many years to get to where we are today. Uh, my program actually uh, goes back about 50 years. Um, we're going to be cele celebrating our 50th anniversary, I think, in, in 2022. So if COVID relapsed, we'll have a big party up in Seattle. You guys are all invited. Um, but we have, over the years, uh, basically been uh, positioning ourselves to answer critical questions about uh, ocean pollution as a seafood safety issue for National Marine Fisheries Service, but then also um, as, a, as a threat to the mission with respect to healthy habitats and also to the conservation of protected resources. And so uh, there have uh, always been pollution habitat issues for NOAA, um, and there likely will be for the foreseeable future. Uh, much of this work in the 20th century was uh, looking at legacy industrial activities, and so Superfund related work on contaminants uh, like PCBs and DDTs and PHs. Um, more re recently, we've been focusing on uh, human activities that are likely to, to pose conservation challenges for the future. And that's why this uh, focus on stormwater today. And again, we are a research group uh, nested within uh, NOAA and NOAA trees. Um, we're on the wet side of NOAA, as opposed to the weather service and some of the other parts that you're familiar with. Um, our job is to produce targeted science to help, you know, understand and produce pollution impacts on species. And so again, we have a habitat focus, we have an endangered species focus uh, that is not just salmonids, but also circles and corals. Uh, there's obviously a sustainable fisheries component to the work that we do. And then uh, the, the key goal, and you'll see this today, is that our organization is, is premised around uh, targeted research. And so we're doing a lot of laboratory stuff, a lot of mechanistic research, a lot of uh, analytical chemistry and and mechanisms of action for known and unknown toxic chemicals. Uh, the reconnaissance piece of it in the lower left is, is all of the field work. So getting out of the laboratory and using sort of modern tools to help us diagnose and monitor uh, habitat conditions uh, in natural systems. And then the third part of it is really important is the synthesis, which is the, you know, the modeling, the risk assessment, the science communication, the educating stakeholders and the outreach. And so the, the talk today is in that, in that category, the lower right. Um, this is a slide that I borrowed from a paper that came out in Science um, a couple of years ago, and it's just talking about the evolving uh, science of conservation from the 1960s to the to the present day. And, and what you're seeing here at the top is essentially this movement on the 60s and 70s is an understanding of 
conservation built around nature for nature's sake, uh, and then transitioning from the 70s to the 80s to the nature's despite people, nature for people and people in nature. And so time in particular is that we've got a lot of our foundational U.S. natural resource management laws that are relevant to the presentation today. And these are laws like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act um, and others and FIFRA, for example, that were passed in the 1970s or amended. And so they, they have set the framework for how we're approaching natural resource management in the modern era. But in many respects, the, the science has changed a lot. And the natural resource management strategies, adaptive management and whatnot has changed a lot as well. And so we've got, uh, we've got sort of these overarching uh, legislative mandates that we're operating within, but uh, obviously our horizons have broadened a lot. And in the current paradigm today, you know, we're, we're basically with people coexisting with nature as full, you know, as central to this particular seminar, because we're really talking about long-term changes in environmental uh, conditions. And that's, in our case, it's West Coast uh, looking at future patterns of population growth and human um, human migration. And so essentially, as we're, as we're building out these coastal watersheds and we're adding more and more impervious surfaces and also looking at changes in, in rainfall patterns over time, how are these uh, persistent forcing pressures likely to affect uh, water quality and ecological health? The adaptability piece of it is um, in our in this particular context of today's talk is really around the role of science and uh, creative problem solving and looking at um, uh, basically data gaps that, that are, are essential as we're to to meet these challenges of, of evolving environmental change. And then the last piece of it is the resilience, which is again more on the creative problem solving. What are we going to do? Um, what steps need to take from a from a decision making and a, and a management standpoint to effectively anticipate um, water quality threats to West Coast salmon and to to mitigate those or to minimize those. Um, again, for those of you that are out of the region, uh, the Endangered Species Act uh, driven priorities for NOAA on the West Coast revolve around these distinct population domains. So we call them population segments uh, or evolutionarily significant units. So these are areas that have distinct um, sort of genetic uh, stocks that are managed separately under the ESA. And they include overlapping populations of coho and chinook and chum and sockeye and steelhead. Uh, most of the talk today is is on coho, um, and I realize that you know coho are, are a relatively dominant lowland uh, salmon species in the Pacific Northwest urban areas, not so much in the Central Valley. But you'll hear me talk later a little bit about some other comparative work that we're extending the science to other species, including steelhead. So you'll see a version of this uh, later in the talk. Uh, this is a a trend that. Uh, was identified a couple of decades ago and has been ongoing. Uh, this is a different part of NOAA, the National Ocean Service, looking at, at coastal rates of, of population growth. And so this is reflecting the fact that that across the country, people really favor living in coastal counties and particularly living in coastal watersheds. And, and those population growth trajectories in coastal areas are increasing and have been for a long time. And we're particularly seeing that in the Pacific Northwest. So we're seeing uh, in certain areas, rapid acceleration of land conversion from forested or agricultural lands into urban, suburban, exurban uh, development. And so uh, we're, again, we've been seeing these trends for a long time, but this, um, this is in, in our neck of the woods up here in the Northwest is, is, a, is a major issue because of the population growth that we've been seeing in recent years. So this is a commonality um, for what happens when you have a, uh, relatively forested or underdeveloped uh, landscape that is converted to, into hardscape. So you're seeing more uh, water running off surfaces into receiving waters, into surface flows, um, less evaporation, et cetera. And so the gradual change of land cover, and, and uh, Jessica will talk about this quite a bit more, uh, can have profound effects on the, on, the, on the hydrology and water flow and uh, the movement of contaminants in, in these coastal watersheds. Um, what we're doing today is is a uh, is basically nested within this larger understanding of a global phenomenon called the urban stream syndrome. Uh, this uh, gradual uh, change in land cover is something that is not unique to the United States. It's happening in major metropolitan city plexus throughout the world, and uh, in uh, on the ground, um, you know, field assessments have consistently shown that these changes in land cover are associated with ecological decline. And uh, the reasons for those declines um, are a, a big area of ongoing research because, and they're complicated because it's not just 
water quality that's affected. It's the hydrograph and it's water quantity. It's um, it's scour. It's you know all these physical habitat attributes and plus the biological as well. So non-native species and and other processes. So there's a big mix of physical, chemical, and biological changes to the landscape that drive this this biological decline. And, and nested within that are, are the role of water quality. Um, and the elevated contaminants piece of that is very poorly understood. So this is where we are we are working. We're in the context of the causes of the urban stream uh, syndrome globally, how this manifests in the Western United States uh, with coho salmon as a sentinel species, and then just the complexity of what this means with respect to the needle in the haystack and trying to figure out what is um, what is killing these fish. And again, uh, there's a lot of people that are working on this problem more generally throughout the world, a lot of academic colleagues in particular. Okay, so uh, we obviously, as an ecotoxicology program for NOAA, do a lot of work on uh, conventional and known contaminants. And so for years, we have published a bunch of papers on the effects of, for example, copper on salmon olfaction, on uh, flame retardants, on PCBs and PHs, et cetera. Um, so we know a lot, again, by virtue of, of our focus on legacy industrial activities from the 20th century, uh, the work on emerging uh, chemicals, be they pharmaceuticals or pesticides, et cetera. So there's, there's a lot of potentially toxic compounds that are out there in salmon habitats. And, and many of those have been familiar to the research community for a long time. And our group and others have worked on those. Um, that's not so much the focus today. We are sort of going into the, the unknown um, uh, aspects of, of stormwater chemistry and what might be driving biological response there. Uh, like uh, other areas of the West Coast, there are a lot of stormwater outfalls into salmon habitats. And this is just an example from our area and the greater Puget Sound, some data from our, our Department of Ecology. So these are stormwater outfalls. Um, every time it rains, and it does up here a lot, uh, we get this direct flow of water from surface um, surfaces, uh, impervious and otherwise, into uh, either receiving waters or directly into coastal marine waters, into the estuary. And so uh, the non-point sources that we're focusing on eclipse in some respects the point source discharges uh, in terms of loadings of contaminants. And, and here and elsewhere, uh, it's been recognized that these non-point sources of pollution are uh, by far and away the management challenge of the 21st century because of the distributed nature of the contaminants, the fact that they are integrators for human activities across multiple um, categories of human land use and uh, the, just the sheer, the complexity of the chemicals involved is really, is, is really major. Okay, so the setup for this um, is that in the 1990s, the city of Seattle and other municipalities in the Northwest were uh, beginning to implement major uh, habitat recovery projects. And, and a lot of these projects basically were initially dealing with impassability. So there were, there were impassable culverts and other blockages that were keeping coho and other salmonids from being able to get back into these restored um, urban waterways. And what they did is, uh, is in the process of were hiring field uh, biologists to go out there and look at the, to the extent to which um, the coho and other species were coming in and using this newly accessible habitat. And so in, when, when they were doing this in the 1999, 2000, they were reporting these anecdotal observations of fish behaving very weirdly. And so this is a, this is a video from 2000 in the upper left. And this is an ocean bright female. She's come back into Piper's Creek, which is in Northwest Seattle. And, uh, and the fish has been in fresh water for maybe an hour or two. And what you're seeing is, is what we now know is this very stereotypical syndrome of distress. And so you're seeing a loss of equilibrium, a loss of orientation. This is a, a, another fish from this, uh, a, another urban creek, you know, almost 15 years later. And so uh, same thing, the fish become effective, they're surface swimming, they're gaping, loss of equilibrium, loss of orientation, they basically tumble down the streams. Um, this has been ongoing in every single urban stream where we have coho that we've got knowledgeable people that have been doing surveys for almost the last 20 years. So it is a very geographically widespread phenomenon on the West Coast. And the mortality rates in some of these highly urbanized areas can be very high, as much as 90 to 100% across the entire run. The mortality phenomena is quantitated from our, our field surveys by the presence of unspawned eggs and females. And so you're seeing this here when you find these carcasses, these fish will be dead within minutes. And uh, in the case of females, you know, they're essentially almost 100 percent egg retention. So that when we talk about rates of mortality and the severity of these fish being affected across gradients of, of urbanization, what we're really talking about is the presence of either these symptomatic fish 
uh, or the presence of females in particular that are still full of eggs. So that's the quantitative metrics. Very straightforward. Uh, we, we've trained hundreds of volunteers and citizen scientists to be out in urban watersheds to be looking for this. We have uh, web content that we've developed. We have worksheets and things like that. And so this this is something that, um, and you'll hear me talk later about, about coho as a sentinel species for stormwater in urban watersheds. And one of the reasons is that the public is, is this is such an obvious phenomenon and it's easy for the public to engage on it. So there's a, there's a science education component to this that's been very effective. Okay, so to summarize the first 10 or 12 years worth of work on this, it took a, a very long time and a very large team for us to encounter enough fish that were symptomatic in those videos that I showed you, but were still alive because we needed, we were basically doing a bunch of forensic analyses on blood chemistry, pathogen status, um, uh, physiology, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, in the course of a, of a given survey year, you might encounter four or five or six of the symptomatic fish. And so it took about five or six or seven years worth of surveys to get the samples that we needed to do this big forensic analysis that you see under number. And so in 2011, we basically um, uh, showed all the data that essentially ruled out uh, low dissolved oxygen or temperature or the fish were in poor condition or the fish were exposed to pathogens or whatever. We also found over multiple years of surveys that the rates of mortality in urban streams are very high, more than like 70%. Um, the issue there, uh, immediately looking at uh, how this related to land cover, and I'll talk more about this leading up to Jessica's presentation, is that it looks like uh, we basically, in the early days, were finding uh, the higher rates of overall mortality in the most urban and most built out watersheds. And then the other piece of this, from a conservation standpoint, is, is simply we started to, to build population models to ask if you were to flip a switch, and to superimpose the rates of mortality that we're seeing on, on wild coho and urban streams, um, how long would it take to drive those local populations um, extinct? And the reason we're doing this is that we think this has been going on for a long time. The, the earliest indications we have uh, in our area is at least in the 1980s. So the State Department of Ecology got into a, a gray literature study of this phenomenon in, in the mid-1980s in Bellingham, so probably 30 or 40 years and maybe longer. Um, so the issue is that we, we really don't know right now how much these mortalities that have been happening every year have contributed to historical declines. Um, so there's a retrospective aspect to this science, which is understanding what happened in the past with these losses. And then you know, the rest of the talk, you'll see me talk a lot about proactive planning, um, really understanding and, and forecasting hotspots for future vulnerability. Uh, and so one of the things that I just want to mention here real quickly is that we've gone from the field, um, we're doing a bunch of laboratory studies, and we'll talk more about these, but basically we're harvesting urban runoff for controlled exposures, both with adults and also with, uh, with juvenile salmonids and other species. And so this is from a high, uh, a high traffic arterial, and it's actually right next to our science station in Seattle. So the road runoff, when it rains, goes right off to the right here and down into our parking lot where we collect it from a downspout. And so we have been monitoring the chemistry and toxicity of storms um, from this location and others for many years uh, over many papers. But basically, uh, you know, from a manipulation standpoint, the water's coming in and then we've got controlled exposures either with these PVC tubes each have individual salmon, either in clean water or in storm water. Um, and what we're finding with exposures to um, either clean water or uh, collected urban runoff is that basically every storm, so, so uh, this is a fish in clean water and for it's been exposed in those PVC tubes for three and a half hour and here's a fish that's been exposed to stormwater. So what you're seeing is that same symptom, the same series of loss of equilibrium, loss of orientation. And we did that over the course of three years over multiple storms. And so what you see here is daily rainfall by date in the fall. This is um, rainfall patterns in the gray bars, the cumulative rainfall is in the dotted lines. And then these are the, the these square um, rectangles, I'm sorry, these, these black rectangles are where we were collecting stormwater and doing exposures. And so four sets of exposures in 2012, two sets in 2013, three in 2014, in all, all cases, unfiltered stormwater was 100% lethal within four hours to adult coho. Um, and all of our uh, fish and clean water survived as you would expect. So this, the untreated stormwater is, in, is incredibly lethal to coho uh, uh, and basically working either with highway runoff or uh, with surface waters in various streams. Okay, so uh, 
from transitioning there, w w you know, we've got multiple different research shows that are ongoing. We're going to uh, spend the middle part of the talk talking about land cover and modeling and looking at how patterns of mortality and patterns of, uh, of water chemistry change over gradients of urbanization. And we started this a long time ago with Blake Feist at our Science Center and Eric Buell on the landscape ecology part. And so the idea is in the early days, because the water chemistry was so complicated, we knew this was gonna take us years potentially to decipher. And at the same time, we knew that the fish were doing a lot uh, more poorly in the most built out watersheds. And so we had, a, we had a sense just from our early field surveys that there was a link to land cover. And uh, at the time, we were surveying six streams and we had one reference site out of Seattle. So we had a relatively limited data set, but we just wanted to it was the relationships were robust enough for us to be able to say anything meaningfully about uh, where uh, fish were likely to be affected as a function of land cover. And the reason we did this is we we're trying to develop predictive maps. And the predictive maps are useful for us not only to understand where to look for this in unmonitored streams, but it was also a big citizen science tool to help um, local watershed stewards and K through 12 education groups and others um, know where to potentially look based on, on salmon their areas and so that analysis basically uh it was a tough analysis to do because these imperviousness uh metrics like uh like building roofs parking lots streets roads they're they're highly autocorrelated and so the statistical modeling was was uh quite challenging but basically even with a limited number of streams we we're able to find a strong correlation between imperviousness and the severity of the fish kills uh, we also indicated that the coho and puget sound are likely to be affected um, across a big part of their range. Um, and this is like 40, 50, 67 percent mortality. So the high rates of mortality in pink, intermediate, and yellow. Um, the problem with this is that the, the initial analyses were based on very few streams, and the streams were mostly highly urban. So all these black dots that you see in the pink area. Um, we didn't have an uncertainty analysis to put uh, confidence intervals in our predictions. Um, we only had the four central counties, and we didn't have a rainfall component, which we really wanted. And so we went back and did it again and reached out to a whole large network of partners. Uh, this is the Wild Fish Conservancy, uh, the Siliguamish Tribe, uh, the Suquamish Tribe, and others, and uh, went to more than 50 different sites and got much better representation across the gradient of urbanization. And you're seeing that in the green, uh, relatively low urban areas that we surveyed, as well as the, the red crosses that are highly urban. Um, the, this analysis was particularly helpful for us because we, for the, unlike the, the earlier analysis, we were able to distinguish between just the amount of pavement. And what I'm focusing on here is the, is the, is the, the transition from low developed to immediate developed to high developed. So this is more pavement going this way. The arrow going to the right is the, is the increase in correlation with the rates of mortality that we're seeing. And what you're here, seeing here is vehicle traffic. And so, whereas the total amount of pavement is not really influencing the the mortality rates that we've been observing in the field at those 50 plus sites. Um, we do see big differences in the amount of the of traffic on the traffic grid. So as you're moving from local roads to collector arterials to arterials to interstates, uh, in this direction, you're seeing a much uh, more robust and stronger association with pre -spawn. So that gave us some indication that maybe we should be looking at motor vehicles as the source of contaminants. And this is a paper that we published a couple of years ago. And again, that the the premise there is that we were able to expand it from the four central counties to the entirety of the Puget Sound Basin. Uh, now you're looking at these these vulnerability hotspot maps. We've we've basically migrated this into a um, a searchable mapping tool so that folks can access a much finer scale grid um, at the reach level and uh, and basically make some decisions about where they should either be doing restoration work. So this is an indication of where, if you're thinking about removing culverts and opening up habitat, is that habitat in your yellow area or red area where you could have unintended high rates of mortality because of water quality. Um, it also is very helpful for us because we're, we're going through the next iteration with local um, survey teams to get yet more streams to further refine and improve our model predictions. Okay, so with that, that's the setup for the project that Jessica is um, gonna present to you now, which flows out of this. So we'll do her for the next uh, middle portion of the talk, and then I'll talk about more where the science is gonna go from here. So we're gonna, swi we're gonna try switching screens, and if that fails, I have her slides. So Jessica, we'll hand it over to you. Hi, thank you, Nant. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, I can see your slides as well. Wonderful, and it's in a presenter view as well? That is correct. 
Great, thank you, thank you. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time to listen to our talk today. Nat and I are both uh, excited to be sharing uh, some of the stormwater work and research that's been going on at the Science Center. My portion of the talk today is on one specific study. Nat's been giving a wonderful background and overview of, of many studies and projects. I'm gonna focus in on one particular study, and this is a study we are currently working on, and uh, the, the paper that in, includes all of this this data is uh, in preparation, really is, is uh, very much ready to be uh, submitted for publication. So that's something to keep an, an eye out for within the scientific literature. The title of this talk is Aligning Land Use and Water Quality Across a Gradient of Urbanization in Puget Sound Using Biological Anchors as Indices of Stream Health. So it really uh, is a, a step, the next step in the land use analysis that, that Nat was just presenting. On the bottom of the slide, I show the, the contributors and co-authors on this publication. It really has been a collaborative effort with the University, University of Washington in Tacoma, as well as with other colleagues at the Northwest Fishery Science Center of NOAA. In particular, I want to note that Catherine Peter, she is the co-lead author on this paper, and I will uh, refer to her again in later in the talk, and you'll see how it was really our, our two specialties and, and expertise coming together that allowed for uh, this paper and this um, study to come together. So the objective of this study is to align the chemical water quality and stream health using these biological anchors. And the anchors that we use for this study are both the macro invertebrate, invertebrate richness, uh, so really the, the bugs in the stream as an indicator of stream health, as well as the coho salmon mortality with much of what uh, Nat has been talking talking about earlier in this presentation. When we talk about uh, traditional water quality guidelines, uh, many of us are familiar with these, with these guidelines. The, the definition of water quality now is guided by both conventional pollutants. This includes oxygen demand, uh, solids, uh, fecal coliform, pH, as well as a list of priority pollutants, which really includes compounds such as metals, PCBs, and others. What the focus of, of this study was is consideration of these other chemicals that are within the water, these hundreds to thousands of unknown chemicals. And these are chemicals that are at environmentally measurable concentrations, but we, we don't know much about them. They're unidentified and because of that unmonitored, and we, we don't know much about them, including fate and toxicity outcomes of these chemicals. And that was something that was an objective of the study was to to get a better understanding of, of what those chemicals, uh, at least the diversity of those chemicals are. To address this, we went back to the, the landscape uh, analysis that was done by uh, Eric Buell and Blake Feist, the paper, the Roads to Ruins paper that Nat just referenced. We looked at this map, this will look familiar, the coloration at least, where there was a gradient of urbanization that went from a high urban areas to medium urban areas to low urban areas. The figure on the left is the upper northwest corner of Washington state, uh, which likely looks familiar to many of you, but I, I know this is a national audience. <laughs> so this is Washington state. Specifically, the inset is then of the Puget Sound region. This is the marine waters and freshwater basins leading into those marine waters within the Seattle area. The red dots represent where the where water samples were taken for this study. And the water sampling sites, there was 15 different streams that were studied across 2017 and 18. They were specifically sampled across a the gradient of urbanization that was defined by uh, Eric Buell and Blake Feist, covering low to medium to high urban environments. There were 65 water samples collected across these 15 streams. Uh, and that is due to repeat sampling that was done in each of these streams. We wanted to collect samples that represented uh, different seasons and, and different precipitation of events uh, within each of these watersheds. In particular, we collected uh, waters during base flow, and base flow is considered a time of low precipitation events. Uh, in Seattle area, in this Puget Sound region, that means at the really the end of the summer months. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> uh, this, this region can go many months without rain, uh, and so sampling at the end of summer allowed us to capture that, that low precipitation time frame. Uh, then other samples were collected during active rain events in both fall, so uh, kind of September, October, 
winter in about January and spring, which uh, was samples were collected in June. With 65 water samples in hand representing these 15 different streams, the next step was to do an analysis of these water samples. And this is where Kathy Peters' expertise really came into play. Kathy is a, a biochemist. So she took these samples and used instrumentation that she had available, which was the quadrupole time of flight. It's a high resolution mass spec. And for those that may not be as familiar with this instrumentation, is this instrumentation allows you to not just to not look at just target analyses. This is the classic way to look at samples where you have um, you have a standard and you are measuring a sample to find that that known standard. What the time of flight, this high resolution mass spec instrumentation allows you to do is run these these samples and in this case these water samples and look for all all chemicals and compounds within that sample. They are identified as unique based on mass and retention time. So they are not known. It is they are unidentified samples, but what we do know is that they are unique compounds. Running these 65 water samples through this analysis, Kathy was able to identify 7,000 unique features. And features is, is what we refer to these unidentified unique chemicals compounds as is these features. Uh, many, I would say most of those are uh, certainly at the time of the study work uh, unidentified samples or unidentified compounds. Now this is where I came in. I came in as the data analyst, taking these 7,000 unique features across these 65 samples and looking at correlations within the features themselves. And I did this using a dimension reduction technique called non-metric multidimensional scaling or MDS. For those of you who may be familiar with uh, principal components analysis, a PCA, this is something very similar. The MDS is similar to PCA. It's commonly used for ecologic samples because it can handle non-parametric data and it can handle data that has uh, zero values. Uh, and that is because uh, all the 7,000 features were not necessarily identified in every single sample, rather uh, were rep represented across the different samplings. Using this technique and inputting the 7,000 features into this program, I was able to reduce the data into four unique data variables, which I refer to throughout this talk as MDS 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now these four variables represented the variability of the 7,000 features, but gave us a more manageable data set within these correlated variables to look at uh, and in, to interpret what some of the correlations may may mean and to better understand the, the chemicals within these waters. I also looked at these profiles of chemical chemical water quality and did other statistical associations to uh, allow us to statistically understand these associations of chemical water quality and watershed characteristics as well as ecological and biological health indicators. The MDS is wonderful for visualization, but paired with the, these statistical tests uh, helps us understand what the statistical associations are with a visual uh, guide to help us uh, best, best understand what, what we're seeing and what the data is, is sharing. So the first thing I did with, then the first thing I'll show today is to share what the visual association was, or relationship was between MDS1 and MDS2. Now what you see here are 65 points, which represent uh, each of the 65 water samples collected. And this is this, this uh, reduced data, this uh, reduced dimensionality representing the data by these MDS1 and MDS2. Uh, and when you look at this, you can see that they are not, there's, they are not randomly put on this plot. If they were, you would see dots within the entire box, but you can see that there is, there is indeed a trend within this data. So the next step I did was to take the data that you see here and I pulled in the information that we knew about these water samples, which was uh, the where these samples, the watershed these samples were collected from, where they fell within the, the urbanization gradient, low, medium, or high urbanization. When I layer on that level of information, and color code it for for uh, for ease visually. What you can see is a, tr a certainly a trend within the data. Now, if you find that black arrow and along that is horizontal to the, to the x-axis, which is MDS one, if you follow that arrow from left to right, you'll see that the 
the markers on the left are green, representing low er samples collected from low urban areas. The middle samples are yellow, representing medium urbanization area, area areas or samples. And on the right, it's, they're red, so representing high urbanization samples. And the definitions of these were based on that, the urbanization gradient from uh, Blake Feist and Eric Buell's paper. But what's different about this is that level of information was not put into the, the data analysis itself. The program only saw the features and clustered the features based on the chemical profile. This additional information about where those samples were collected from is something that I added in just for this visual within this figure itself. So what we can say, what we can see from this paper is this arrow represents this gradient of urbanization from left to right. Now the MDS data is uh, is unitless. And so whether these profiles fall in this negative MDS or positive MDS does not matter. What that instead tells us is that the data points on the left, on the, the, the negative MDS scaling, had unique chemical features that make up those profiles of compounds. Whereas those in a the positive MDS scale, those, those red data points have a distinct, an, a different chemical feature that is distinct from those on, on the left side of the figure. Now, something else you'll notice within this figure is a series of samples that have a circle around them, a dashed circle. Now, all of these samples were collected from a single watershed. I mentioned earlier there's repeat sampling within these, these areas, within these watersheds. All of those samples were collected from Salmon Creek. Now, Salmon Creek was the only area sampled that was proximate to a concrete aggregate plant. And what this shows us is MDS2 was able to identify unique chemicals within those samples because they were collected within a landscape characteristic that in itself was unique. What you also notice is that this was part of a the medium category of urbanization. And indeed those yellow markers fall within line with other, other creeks that were characterized as medium, as medium urbanization. I will also point out that I, I put the categories of urbanization on this figure for coloration, for ease of interpretation. But when I ran the analyses, it was all on the continuous scale, giving us a, a full correlation across the gradient of uh, values that were used to define urbanization based on Eric and Blake's paper. That was a way to visually see the correlation of the chemical profile with these categories of urbanization. I did also run statistics. And what you see here is the statistical analysis. I ran a permanova, which is similar to an ANOVA, but it's for uh, non-parametric values. So it's a permutation ANOVA analysis. I used the same land cover characteristics that Nat showed that uh, were used by Eric and Blake for, for their paper, for their development of this gradient of urbanization. And similar to their paper, what you can see here is a uh, statistical significance for the chemicals within the water samples statistically associated with uh, categories such as high, medium, and low intensity of development, uh, imperviousness, which is uh, you know paved surfaces, uh, census data, so population density, as well as roads, as Nat mentioned, and intensity of traffic. When I ran the same statistics with the single vector that Eric and Blake came up with, the single vector representing urbanization, I did also see the statistical significance. Uh, I show this here today to show how the individual characteristics do uh, individually also demonstrate that association. Now to go back to the figure I showed previously, where we have MDS1, which we've now shown as a, a the chemical profile that is showing an urban chemical gradient, and MDS2, which was Salmon Creek. I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that the 7,000 features were reduced to four dimensions. So I'd like to now show what MDS3 looked like. I'm going to maintain the x-axis as MDS1, just so it's uh, visually a bit easier. But now the bottom figure shows MDS3. What I didn't mention earlier is it's not just the coloriza colorization of these markers of the green, uh, yellow, and red to show the urbanization gradient, but I also have had markers have markers within this figure that show samples that were base flow samples, and again, that are, those are samples that were collected during a time of low precipitation, which is to say those samples represent uh, ground flow or groundwater, whereas the colored samples all represent 
All of the colored symbols represent samples collected during an active rain event. So those better represent the inputs into a stream that are brought in through, through the runoff from storm water uh, into, into the watershed being sampled. What you can see here with this visual, visualization is a distinct a distinction in the chemical profiles of the base flow samples relative to the distinctive distinct chemical profile of the stormwater samples. When I ran the Permanova analysis with uh, base flow versus stormwater samples, again, it was statistically significant. So we know we have statistics to support what we are seeing visually within this figure. I did also uh, run MDS4. I'm not going to show that for the sake of time, but I do want to also mention mention it because the fourth dimension, the MDS4, did show a statistical pattern with a season representing uh, fall stormwater versus uh, winter and spring stormwater events. And details of that can be found within the uh, the upcoming publication. So from this, we can say uh, MDS1 represents this urban chemical gradient. And we can rename MDS2 and MDS3 to instead uh, be uh, MDS2 representing uh, the chemical profile of Salmon Creek, which is that in the dashed circle, and MDS3 representing the chemical profiles unique to stormwater relative to base flow samples. Now, having established this chemical profile of urbanization, the next objective to our study, a, a main objective to our study, was to align these, these chemical water quality indicators or, or profiles with stream health. Uh, I mentioned the indicators that we used for this study were both macro invertebrate richness as well as coho salmon mortality. For the sake of time, I'm going to focus uh, the uh, discussion of the results on this, this macro invertebrate richness only. The macroinvertebrate richness, we quantified that using this benthic index of biotic integrity. This is a quantitative method to uh, determine and compare the biological condition of streams. Within Puget Sound, we have, there is a repository that is held and managed by King County that represents not just King County, but all surrounding regions of the metrics of uh, both diversity and abundance of this biota based on 10 different scoring metrics. And this repository represents water samples and data collected across multiple organizations, representing over 20 years of data collected across all months of the year. This is a valuable data point to have uh, because these, these benthic mac macro invertebrates are good indicators, are, are a, a well-established indicator of biological health of a stream uh, because these these bugs play a crucial role in the, the stream ecosystem itself. What we did was, was we downloaded this data, we downloaded this data, and I ran a specific analysis, a regression. It was actually a mixed effects regression analysis using the, the, the vector that represents MDS1, that is what I've, I've demonstrated already, represents the urban chemical gradient. And we looked at uh, the association of that metric with this index of, of macroinvertebrate diversity and abundance, the BIBI. Now for the 15 streams sampled that we had sampled, 12 of those had uh, index of, of this biotic integrity from the same stream as the water samples, sample was collected from. So within the data I'm now showing on this figure, there are 12 points representing those streams where we had uh, paired data points. And within this mixed effects model, this accounted for multiple sampling within each watershed, we do have a significant association of, uh, of the macroinvertebrates and this chemical profile. Where you see where <clears throat> we have a low value for BIBI, means a low abundance and diversity, was associated with the uh, the very positive vector for MDS, so these these high urbanization creeks. You do see a few points that did not fall within this line. There are the, the yellow and the green point to the left. And as I mentioned, this BIBI data, the King County Repository, it covers 20 years of data spanning all months of sampling. We expected a high amount of variability in pairing, pairing this data together and were surprised by how, by by the regression line that we do have, uh, considering the amount of variability in the data. So to have a few that fell off that line is not surprising. 
um, and really is a, a great foundation for future sampling and monitoring efforts to pair these data together. I'm not going to talk about the same same similar parallel analyses we did with the coho salmon mortality, but I will mention where we had uh, where the chemical profile of urbanization was associated with the decrease in macroinvertebrate richness. This same gradient of urbanization was associated with an increase in coho salmon mortality, and that was uh, also had a, a statistically significant association. Now, another part of this analysis was to talk about, you know, not just that we have identified that there are these 7,000 features that I, I've mentioned are, are not, not necessarily known, are unmonitored, unregulated, but what are these compounds is, is really a, a burning question. So a part of the study that we felt was important was to talk about indicator compounds. And these are compounds that we see as to provide a practical metric by which to assess water quality. The indicators identified in this particular study, as I've demonstrated, they're shown to be highly specific to these landscape attributes, as well as this, these impacts, ecotoxicological impacts. But an important point that I would like to make is the intention of the study was to not identify indicator compounds that are culprits in this biological decline. Uh, rather, these chemical indicators that, that we started to look at are those that can support rapid and spatially and temporally resolved evaluations of water quality. Indicator compounds that may be used to translate the effectiveness of approaches such as stormwater treatment and restoration efforts. So truly, truly indicators is, is what, we, what we aimed to look at. To do that, we went back to this, this urban chemical urban gradient, MDS-1, and focused in on, on the chemical profile indicative of an urban environment. In doing that, I selected out features that had a high frequency, uh, were, were frequently present within all samples, as well as had a, a high overall abundance uh, of that individual compound. And in doing that, to filter out the features that are, are part of this, this chemical profile of, of high urbanization, we were able to resolve it down to 206 features. Now, this is a list I then sent back to Kathy Peters, who is the biochemist in the study, and said, I, I was able to narrow it down. There's 206 features that are the most representative of this urban chemical gradient. And she went back to her instrumentation and her programs and was able to categorize those comp those features into broad chemical classes. And what she found were uh, a high frequency and a high abundance of these compounds were often uh, tire derived and industrial chemicals. Uh, the second box is MMM family, which are compounds previously associated with stormwater samples, uh, organophosphates, which is a, a pesticide, as well as plasticizers and surfactants. This is work that's still in progress. But I want to I wanted to mention it today because we do recognize part of this effort is uh, providing a tool to help to help uh, understand how this chemical profile of urbanization, uh, how we can understand um, what's represented within that profile and use it as a guide to have the urban ur water samples within an urban environment look more like water samples collected from an area of low urbanization where there is uh, the ecologic health is has been demonstrated to be of, of a higher quality. In summary, what we did within the study was establish an urban chemical gradient in regional streams around this, the Puget Sound area of Western Washington. We also uh, demonstrated a biological decline associated with this chemical water quality. The next steps are to uh, better understand what these, what chemicals may uh, be indicators uh, to represent the biological decline. It's a, a next generation indicator associated with this degradation that may contribute to effective prioritize, prioritization of, of restoration efforts. Looking at the application of these water quality metrics that scale with urbanization intensity and other metropolitan areas, you know, we anticipate that the water quality metrics 
are broadly applicable to metropolitan areas in other regions. And this is due to similar engineering of built environments across geographic and cl uh, climate differences, as well as universal sources and classes of chemical pollution. Looking ahead, although additional development certainly is necessary to integrate these metrics and approaches with current standards and decision-making frameworks, we do anticipate that applications of this landscape-based predictive metrics and novel indicator chemicals of stream health exemplify that new capabilities within water quality assessments that will augment existing approaches to protect, protect and restore sustainable, healthy aquatic communities. And with that, I will uh, turn the presentation back over to Nat. Great, thank you, Jessica. So the last part of the presentation is essentially going into where the broader uh, research is, is headed. Um, this I've, I've sort of uh, organized into seven kind of broad categories, and there's a lot of unpublished data in here that will be forthcoming in the coming year. Um, and so in brainstorming kind of the content for the talk today, uh, we were, were focusing on this land use uh, analysis because there's just a tremendous amount of coming out. And we kind of think about the data that Jessica was presenting is, is looking at the at the chemical complexity of urban stormwater in its full gory detail. And you know, with this time of flight analysis, uh, we're able to break down uh, water chemistry into its constituent parts based on atomic mass. And so we're dealing with, literally with hundreds and thousands of compounds that are in the urban streams and, and there's these transport processes that we're dealing with the non-point source, the stormwater, and then the land cover issues and transportation issues are areas. And so we think that these these pattern analysis and the big data crunching and statistical analysis that Jessica and Kathy are doing is, is really giving us an indication of what those dynamic patterns look like in space and time. Um, and to, you know, for that effort, we're using the two best biological you know, storylines that we have. One is for bugs and the other is for coho about how those changes in, in chemistry over, over space and time relate to the, the known biology. But clearly there's a lot of work that, that we need to do. Compounds that we're focusing on um, probably have nothing to do whatsoever with the, the coho mortality syndrome and may be contributing in ways that we don't understand to the mortality of all these different bugs. And so um, we are showing those data, but clearly we're, we're raising a lot more questions that we can answer in the near term. And so that's that piece of it. And then the other, uh, the other sections that I want to dive into briefly here at the end um, are these, each of these are theme areas that could come up in future seminars. And so we, we were talking about the topic areas to dive into in more detail in future storm sponsored uh, seminars. And so if any of these are particularly interesting, yeah, let our organizers know and we'll try to, we'll try to bring that to you later down the road. Okay, so uh, going through these quickly, the first priority for the extended research team is obviously to identify the smoking gun that's killing coho and possibly other species as well. And so this has been an objective of ours for a long time. As I mentioned with the forensic analysis that we did in the 2000s, we were very focused on known bad actors. And so we've made artificial stormwater containing mixtures of metals and pHs and the coho uh, are basically impervious. They do not, um, no pun intended, they do not, uh, uh, are, are not showing the syndrome in, in response to combinations of even high levels of metals and hydrocarbons. So essentially what we've done is a, is a big correlational analysis. And, and, and in, again, this is work that's led by Utah Tacoma and Ed Collegius group. Um, and also with the, the Washington State University folks at the stormwater. Essentially what Jen McIntyre and her students have been doing is breaking down um, uh, sources of contaminants that come from motor vehicles. So it could be windshield wiper fluid, it could be motor oil, it could be antifreeze or whatever. And then running through that, the the um, the time of flight analysis for the feature detection. And then what you're seeing in the SR520, that's the highway that comes right by our science center in Seattle. So those are, those are what, five different storm events. And so it's a, a feature pattern comparison for five different storms from the same source. And then at the bottom, you're seeing Miller Creek and Duwamish Creek. Um, and what we're seeing there are surface waters in Seattle where we have coho that are coming in to spawn in the fall and dying. And so this big Venn diagram analysis is essentially saying of those thousands of, or hundreds of compounds uh, in stormwater, some of which are the focus for what Kathy and Jessica have been working on, um, which, one, which ones are in discrete sources of contaminants from, from motor vehicles and other sources, which ones are in the highway runoff, which ones are in the surface water habitats of salmon are spawning, et cetera, et cetera. Can we begin to take the haystack of possible bad actors and, and make that haystack smaller? And then the work that's ongoing now, and we'll have, we'll have updates for the community in the coming weeks and months, um, is essentially getting to the point with a small enough 
group of compounds that we can start to do a fractionation analysis, a conventional PIE or an effects driven analysis to uh, further manipulate the stormwater to try to figure out uh, what that, that actor is. And so, uh, or our actors. And so essentially what you're seeing here is the initial work. Again, Kathy's the lead on this. And what we're doing is, is um, and, and what you're seeing from that is a cluster analysis. And so here, what I've done is I've replot those distributions for surface waters and stormwaters that are known to be lethal. And then looking at those, those features and the one source of contaminants for motor vehicles that clusters with the known toxic surface waters is tire wear particles, which I'm showing here. And we have other unpublished data showing that leachate from tire wear particles is, is acutely lethal to both adult coho and to juveniles. It's, uh, there's a lot of different compounds that come from different sources of cars. There's overlap, for example, with motor oil and, and other things, but we see a particularly strong association with, with the chemical profiling of leachate from tire wear particles with what's in our water and what's killing the fish. So it's another suggestive line of evidence for, for motor vehicles. Uh, the second major focus area right now is, uh, is better defining the time course. Um, so we've had a lot of questions over the years about, you know, if, if there's a single storm event and it lasts four hours, Exposure long enough to cause the the phenomena. So, are the laboratory studies that we're doing with short-term exposures ecologically relevant? Um, the other question that we've always had is, if a fish becomes symptomatic and it stops raining, and the fish is in clean water, relative clean water, will it recover? So, that is an unanswered question that we've had. And then the third is, you know, we're working with a lot of our experimental work is is direct highway runoff from a dense urban arterial, and so obviously that's not representative of, of the runoff that you're likely to find in most other uh, site-specific um, outfalls. So we've basically been asking, how much dilution do you need to to begin to be protective and and to start to see this this mortality syndrome go away? Uh, the other big piece of it too was to verify that the syndrome was not just in the adult spawners, and that that's a that's a nuanced issue, but it was a really big one for us uh, logistically, because if the if the only fish that were dying were adult coho, then that gave us about six or seven weeks in any given year to do research. So we would have to wait for the fish to come back to urban streams. As I mentioned, um, they're very difficult to find um, when they're symptomatic, and it takes a long time. You don't get very many samples in any given year, and, and then if you don't do it right, you got to wait a year to go out and get more data. So what we basically did is uh, a full characterization of the phenomena in juveniles. And it turns out that juvenile coho are similarly susceptible. They show the same suite of symptoms, and I'll show you some videos of that. And the thing about juveniles is that they're available in high numbers and amenable to high throughput. And so for the purposes of this, this chemistry that I was talking about earlier, if we had to do a fractionation analysis um, with a really complicated uh, environmental sample of stormwater, and we had to do all of our testing, on adult coho for six weeks in any given year, it would take us 100 years to get at this. And so the ability to do the screening with juveniles in a high throughput format has definitely accelerated um, our uh, the speed of discovery for this question. And so some main things that I just want to leave you with where the science is going is that the fish uh, become symptomatic very quickly. So the onset of the phenomena is typically four to five hours, depending on the storms. And once they become uh, symptomatic, they do not recover. It's a one-way trip. So even the fish that show the earliest signs of symptomology, the surface swimming, once they've hit that stage, if you put them back in clean water, they're, they're not gonna make it back. So whatever, whatever toxicity is happening, it looks to be at least at the organism level irreversible. Um, the other thing, and this is Jasmine Pratt, who's a, a student, a master student in Jetire's group. Um, she did a, a big dilution series and uh, looked across multiple storms. And uh, if you take uh, our runoff and dilute it as much as 90, 95%, uh, it still causes the syndrome. So, so yes, uh, we're doing most of this work on, on, on you know, re relatively concentrated runoff from an urban arteria. But if you take that arteria and put it in 95% clean water, it's still toxic to juvenile coho. Um, third category is what about other species? Um, and so we've been doing a lot of cross-species analysis. This video I'm showing you to the left is actually a field survey in 2006 from Piper's Creek. And that's a symptomatic uh, coho. And, and that year we had an overlapping coho and chum run. And so what you're now doing is panning upstream and you're seeing uh, chum in the same system that are there. And that's a spawning pair digging a, a red. And that year, every coho that came into the system died. And almost all of our choho, coho, I mean, our chum survived to spawn. So that was our first indication from the field because it's relatively rare to have overlapping runs um, in the same stream at the same time. So we had some some early indications that maybe coho were more vulnerable than some of the other salmonids that we work on. 
And uh, we've actually since confirmed that in direct exposures with adult Coho and adult Chum in a paper we published a couple of years ago. So um, essentially, this is not a one size fits all, and not all cell models are similarly susceptible. Coho are very susceptible, and at least adult Chum seem to be relatively not susceptible. Um, we have since extended that to multiple other species. These are unpublished data. Um, they we're writing up the paper right now. So this is looking at juvenile sockeye and chinook and steelhead, and then two size classes of coho. So the first are the are the par, and then the one plus bigger fish um, are on the far right. And this is these are 72 hour assays, so really simple mortality assays. And you're looking essentially at um, the coho to the right. It's the the storms, irrespective of the size of the fish. Um, this is what we always say. It's pretty much 100% lethal for the most part to all the coho, be they large or small. Uh, the steelhead were intermediate. So we saw some mortality uh, and it varied by storm. And so it looks like uh, steelhead are on this mortality spectrum, uh, but they are not as sensitive to coho, at least in terms of the acute effects. Uh, we see nothing from sockeye. So sockeye and chum, at least for the limited studies that we've done so far, seem to be on the unaffected category. And Chinook uh, are suggestive few storms and uh, it's re relatively preliminary data. So we're very focused on steelhead. That's why we did this study in part. And in part, it was because our NOAA uh, habitat biologists in California were asking us a lot of questions about the transferability of the coho data to other species that were more uh, abundant in the Central Valley in particular, including steelhead. Um, the reason this matters from a resource management standpoint and the reason NOAA uh, habitat biologist asked us to look into this is that if you look at the, at the I'm back to this map again on the, on the population segments, but on the left with the capital C's are geographic areas where we have ESA listed coho uh, populations or just coho populations that are not listed. And then on the right with the capital S's are the same distributions where we have steelhead populations um, that are listed. And so we've got, you know, again, if the extension of this potentially to steelhead has significant ramifications for the geographic area that might be af affected by this mortality syndrome. Okay. It's um, sublethal toxicity. So uh, what I wanna say is that it's, you know, in the past 20 years, it's relatively rare to have fish kills in uh, receiving waters or coastal watersheds on the West Coast. Uh, they do happen, but they tend to be accidental spills or extreme events. Um, it is um, really rare to have recurring mortality events, particularly for some uh, large species like an adult returning uh, adult coho spawner. All right, it's been on these fish that are symptomatic and dying, but we think actually there's very likely to be sublethal effects on the physiology and behavior of these fish that are probably happening at concentrations that are a lot lower than what we're working with. And I, this is, these are just two examples of Remember, I mentioned we, we were characterizing the symptom in juveniles, and so these are these are coho par, and that's the very, very earliest indications of the symptomology with a fish are surface swimming and gaping. We think because of this behavior that these fish, um, that there's a cardiorespiratory underpinning for this phenomenon. We think there's a problem with chem the contaminants in the water disrupting normal osmoregulatory function and possibly gas exchange, either at the gill or something about oxygen binding and transport and cardiovascular function. Uh, a few minutes later, maybe an hour later, the fish look like this. So they go from surface swimming to extreme distress, um, loss of equilibrium and gaping, and they swim down, sink down to the bottom, become more abundant. So we just, in the past couple of weeks, uh, got a brand new set of equipment to do swim tunnel respirometry and physiology. Um, we're, our group is very good about this, and so we're going to be looking at, at fish that look outwardly normal, um, and we're going to be looking, basically putting them on a treadmill and doing a stress test in the coming year. Um, and the, the issue there is that not only is to look at, at the actual threshold for toxicity beyond just acute mortality, but to see whether those, um, those other species of fish, notably steelhead, um, are affected um, in terms of sublethal effects in ways that would bring them into the picture. So we think we're missing things by just focusing on adult mortality. We're really focusing and pushing into, into sublethal effects in the next phase. Uh, the point there uh, is to develop new tools, and this is something we're constantly doing. On the left, I'm showing you what we call an adverse outcome pathway that uh, our group developed and others over the course of a couple of decades for oil spill science. And so these are compounds that are in crude oil, these tricyclic PAs that target the, the fish heart. And so the whole point with an adverse outcome pathway is you're working from an environmental contaminant 
a molecular initiating event. This is a mechanism of action. So this is what the contaminant is binding to in the animal. And then you have a series of, of effects. So they could be at the cellular level, at the organ level, and these are cascading adverse outcomes, right? So this is an adverse outcome pathway. And if, it, if in, the, in our case, if we're having a failure of, of gill function or a failure of heart function, this is an adverse outcome at the organ level. And then an AO at the organismal level, in this case, is just the death of the salmon. So in some situations, for some environmental classes of contaminants, these are increasingly well-developed. This one, we don't know what the pathway looks like at all. We know how it ends. We know it ends with mortality, but we don't know what the causal contaminant is. We're working on that. And we don't know how that contaminant initiates this cascade that leads to death. We think that the organs, as I mentioned, are probably involving the cardiovascular system. And that's what, that's what we're going to focus. But the point being is that in, in these other areas of ecotoxicology, it's these molecular initiating events or these key events at the cellular and organ scale, that's where you're developing new diagnostic indicators. So this is where the molecular biology, all of the 21st century you know, uh, genetic profiling of, of gene expression, et cetera, um, that's built around a phenotype of injury can help us with these tools to then go back out in the field and say, in addition to just looking for coho that are dead and full of eggs, can we begin to see these fish showing signs of, of so physiological stress, you know, along a gradient of urbanization. So this is the goal, probably more on a five-year time horizon, is to try to fill in the blanks and establish this chain of causation uh, from the molecular level through through this phenomena that we see at the adult. So that's that's another area that's ongoing. Um, the what does this mean for other species? We don't know right now. This is this is probably the area that needs the most work. Um, we've done toxicity testing with simple bioassays. So these are Daphnia, or uh, we're really focusing on salmon food prey species, and so this, we have some work on mayflies. Uh, but we don't know a lot about other fish. Uh, I mentioned the, the comparative work with other salmonids. Um, we've done a lot of work with zebrafish, but these compounds that we're focusing on are ubiquitous, and they're going to be in other parts of the country and other parts of the world. So there will be a lot of questions about, you know, as we get closer and closer to unidentified um, but newly appreciated toxic agents, what those might be doing with other species in other parts of the country and the world. Um, the reason that that, that I, I bring this up right now is that we've really been talking about this question about sentinel species, and this touches a little bit on what Jessica was presenting, right? So the issue is 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 if if you look at the numbers of compounds that we're dealing with, which is potentially in the thousands, and the numbers of species that we're managing in coastal habitats, it could be hundreds. And so if you do the factorial analysis of all those combinations, there, there's just not enough time or resources to look at at those interactions. And so one of the issues is, you know, do can we develop sentinel species for this stormwater thing in particular and stormwater impacts that will basically both tell us when watersheds are becoming increasingly unhealthy because water quality is getting bad or whether mitigation actions and restoration activities at the watershed scale through green infrastructure and other things are working to the extent that we can have sustainable aquatic communities going forward. So the premise in Puget Sound is that uh, you know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of focus on marine waters and, and trying to prevent a lot of contaminants from getting out into, you know, the estuary. And most of those contaminants, when they come from stormwater, flow through spawning habitats for coho salmon. So 10 years ago, when we were talking to stakeholders, you know, the idea was, well, we don't know what's killing the salmon, but, you know, if you take steps through green infrastructure to be protected for coho, you're probably going to be protected for a lot of other species because you're going to have to do a lot to improve water quality. And, and, and we're seeing that with green infrastructure. But uh, as we get closer and closer to this mechanistic work, uh, it may be that whatever is rendering coho particularly susceptible or these other species may not apply to striped bass in the Chesapeake or you know lake trout in the Great Lakes or whatever. We just don't know. So that's uh, a lot of work to be done. Uh, it would be very helpful for us to have a sentinel that was specific for stormwater toxicity. Um, we're not there yet. That's kind of the pressuring that we're working towards. Uh, the IVI thing that has been the gold standard for a long time, um, we have found in, in our in our practices, it's very good at diagnosing when a stream system is unhealthy and degraded. It is not so good at basically saying, coming back to all of the myriad physical, chemical, and biological habitat processes that are deteriorating habitat quality. So when it comes time to like know what to do or, or make recommendations, it's harder to do that when you have um, chemical and non-chemical stressors. And so ideally, salmon in particular will be useful um, for the water quality angle. Okay, so the last major focus, and, and this is really spearheaded by John Stark and Jen McIntyre at Washington State University and the Stormwater Center, where they have been investing heavily 
Oh, and stormwater, uh, green stormwater infrastructure effectiveness, and so bioretention and soil columns and permeable pavement um, and permeable asphalt. But then also they are a major interface with um, municipalities and others that are just trying to learn how to do this and, and better implement these strategies. And, and you know, the science, the, the idea is to um, have enough science and research that goes into um, a treatment method in such a way that, that it's reliable and it's not constantly evolving and driving landowners getting new new directions every year. So there's a, a long term um, long term uh, analysis of different conventional inexpensive remediation strategies that uh, are demonstrably effective and are scalable. That's kind of the holy grail for what we're trying to do. Um, this is a big deal, obviously, in our region. Uh, there's a lot of uh, stakeholder partners, NGOs and others that are that are working with the public and working with others. Um, Sam and Safe and stewardship partners up here are, are big ones. And so there's a, a good, good opportunities for science and, and resource managers and, and interfacing with others that are doing public outreach and education and the like. A lot of it built around things like rain gardens that people can can see and um, and contribute to. Uh, and we started this a while ago. We've done uh, basically taken that same stormwater that killed everything and put it through very simple soil columns, which is another talk to kind of explain how those are all constructed. But by and large, the water that comes out of those soil columns um, is practically non-toxic in terms of the mortality phenomenon. So it's it's highly protective in terms of the this mortality thing. So whatever's killing these fish seems to be captured in our, our soil columns. And uh, it's not just the fish, it's actually the other species as well. So uh, big positive improvements for uh, invertebrates um, as I mentioned before, we've been using the extensive molecular toolbox and zebrafish to help us focus on certain classes of contaminants. Those also are showing good um, effectiveness as well. So we're very encouraged by um, by how well green infrastructure works. Right now, you know, our 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 soil infrastructure columns are very small. They're very site specific. They're laboratory and bench shop. The soil. Uh, the systems themselves are a bit of a black box because we don't know what we're looking for in terms of chemicals. We just know that it's there when it goes in and it's not there when it comes out. At least the fish are telling us that. So this area in particular um, has all kinds of really important practical questions about what soil types do you use? Are you making sure your exporters are something that you don't want into groundwater? Um, how long do these things last? How deep do they have to be? Um, what's the maintenance schedule to ensure how many of them are you going to need at a watershed scale? It's one thing to have it at a local site within a watershed. It's another thing entirely to try to protect, you know, miles and miles of surface water. Um, so these are all questions that are that are really pressing for, for us and others. And then again, uh, looking forward, as I mentioned, we've got this retrospective focus on, on how big of an issue was this in the past and we just didn't know about it. And the, then, then the future calculations about where is this going to be a problem in the future. And so, again, uh, the indirect evidence is pointing to the transportation grid and motor vehicles as potentially um, sources of the contaminants that are killing these coho. And when we're looking to the future, major municipalities on the West Coast uh, are, are in the middle of long-term, decades-long planning for where they're going to put people and cars in the future. And so by county, we have these land use planning projections for where the traffic is likely to expand going forward. And so we, we're, we, we have the capability to overlay these future projections of where they're going to, we're going to see more people uh, with where coho are most vulnerable. So this is, this is useful for protect the last best places. Um, big questions about how much infrastructure we're going to need to have, you know, salmon and people coexisting side by side, et cetera. So there's a lot more modeling to be done in the future, um, again, to kind of weave this all together. So with that, I think I think we're at time, and I'll uh, kick it back over to Sarah and company for. Nat, Jessica, this was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for joining us and you know sharing all of this great research. It was a great and interesting talk. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really looking forward to being able to see some of these publications coming out. Uh, do you think you can give a teaser, Nat, on kind of timeline for, for what NOAA might be publishing when? Uh, most of the of them here are, are in manuscripts that are in preparation. So the timeline for that is probably weeks to months. Um, definitely 2021 at the latest. Um, there's this, this is interspersed with stuff that's already published too. So if anybody has direct follow up questions or really want to dive into the technical data, our papers have very long, usually supplemental materials that has all the analytical chemistry we've done and the modeling and everything else. And so if you, if you want to go um, deep into that technical stuff, you can either email me or Jessica and we'll, we'll connect you with that. 
Fantastic. Um, also, I just want to remind everybody on the phone, we are not doing verbal Q&A at this particular time. Um, I'm hoping that AV services can put the email address on the screen. Um, but as we transition more into a Q&A mode, I just want to remind everybody that you can uh, email us questions using the storms at waterboards.ca.gov email address. Daniel Delgado is standing by to see what questions are coming in. And um, I am again hoping that AV services can pop that email onto the screen uh, for everybody to be able to visually see it uh, if they can't hear me say it. Uh, to quickly kick off Q&A, uh, Nat, you did a fantastic wrap up, but I was just kind of curious for you and Jessica to sort of tag team a little bit on the question, what are some of the practical applications of this research? Back when I was in university, I looked at caffeine as a potential indicator of sewage contamination for underground pipes. Um, you've talked a little bit about how fish could be uh, a sentinel species for stormwater impacts and pay, maybe even inform BMP design, but, but can you maybe go into taking some of this work that you've presented today to some maybe practical translatable um, applications that might apply to California or non-Puget Sound areas. Uh, Jessica, do you want to have her first crack at that since that was kind of a through line in your talk? Uh, no, no, go for it, Nat. Thanks, though. Yeah, okay, so so that's a great question, and uh, it, it delineates between the research that we're doing that's kind of exploratory and research that's more intended for routine monitoring. And, and that's actually true within NOAA. We've got a, a relatively advanced analytical group, but they're not set up necessarily to do the time of flight work. And so our, our thinking is that the time of flight, once we're looking at these uh, complex patterns of, of camp, you know, basically features or metabolites or, or, or whatever that are in urban stormwater and changing you know, across a gradient, uh, the idea is to develop methods for those uh, as tracer compounds, like you mentioned caffeine earlier, that's that's often used as an indicator. In, in Puget Sound, we have this thing every Thanksgiving where the Nagarby Department of the University of Washington starts picking up nutmeg and cinnamon in surface waters of the ocean because it's all going through the wastewater treatment systems and it's highly detectable, right? So so there's there's that's a you know like caffeine that's an example of a tracer compound that reflects a human activity that connects whatever people are doing on the land with the water and so for stormwater we'd like to do that also we'd like to get to um, compounds that are present and are, are are changing in patterns that we know are informative for the biology and the management but are uh, tractable and inexpensive for local municipalities to be able to monitor because the the chemistry that's happening here is is, is almost beyond the reach of a day-to-day -day operation just in terms of instrumentation and expense. And so this um, this push to look at these patterns, find trends that <clears throat> are solid, and find inexpensive surrogates that will give you confidence that 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 what you're measuring, you know, in a monitoring study is actually reflective of these broader patterns is, is a goal that I think we're going to be pushing hard for in the next couple of years. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> I'm definitely going to be following that because I, I've had many side conversations with stakeholders and clients when I worked in consulting over the years about, you know, indicator compounds. So looking forward to hearing more about that in the future. Um, we've given it a couple minutes, so and I understand we might have some uh, questions coming in through the email. Daniel, how many questions do we have? And uh, read off the first one for us, please. Uh, we have three questions so far. So this first one's a bit of a two-parter. It's from Sean rep representing Me Metropolitan Water District. Uh, the question is, I was wondering what your thoughts were on using Bayesian relative risk models to identify the contaminants for management. We are exploring this technique and will be evaluating contaminants with other water quality and land use parameters. And then as a follow-up to that, what other endpoints have you used to measure toxicity and contaminant effects? Have you considered some bioassays or histopathology? Uh, so the Bayesian analysis is that's a great question. Bayesian statistics are integral to the modeling that we did, looking at the land use uh, relationships in the earlier papers, including the the Roads to Ruin paper. Um, and so, uh, Jessica, do you want to do you have anything to say to that if, before I switch over to the endpoints? Uh, not necessarily. It's uh, 
that approach to the statistics is certainly uh, a, a step that could be layered in and, and could kind of take it to, the, kind of to a step further, uh, another way of kind of looking at and incorporating the data. It's something we have, have considered and, and talked about doing. Um, with the data we have in hand, the, our, our current approach is certainly describing describing our data. But as this does uh, build and go to to future steps, I do see that as being a really useful tool to layer in. Certainly. Yeah, I, I would add to that. At the basic statistics were forced upon us because of the complexity and auto correlative nature of the variables that we're looking at, and we're also looking at big data sets. So when we're comparing. Uh, you know, multiple uh, linked land cover uh, categories. And then we have uh, as many compounds and features as, as we're working through these Venn diagrams. The, the Bayesian approach was necessary. And what we're doing from there is that we get more narrowed down to potential causal bad actors. Uh, we're slipping into a little bit more of a regression type format statistically. It's probably more in the weeds than you want to get, but that's the Bayesian statistics are both important and necessary depending on how uh, complex the initial data sets are. To the question about endpoints, um, we are uh, we work on everything from molecular biology to, as you've seen, population modeling and, and landscape modeling. And so our focus physiologically for this um, is going to you know be tailored to the to, to a respiratory function and cardiovascular function. Um, we have a whole bunch of tools that we've developed for oil spill science because a lot of components in oil are targeting the heart. That's why we focus so much on pHs is we thought maybe pHs were actually uh, causal in this factor and there might be a confluence between our, our stormwater science and our oil spill science. And it turns out that it's not that, at least for the adults and these juveniles, it's probably something else. Um, so we will we will still bring that toolbox of assessment physiological endpoints to bear on this, um, but we're starting from scratch a little bit. I should mention that a paper got accepted yesterday from our group that uh, is looking at, and I didn't mention it, it's next steps, but we are, for other species, looking also at forage fish. And so in Puget Sound, we have a lot, and that's true for San Francisco Bay, you have herring and other species that come ashore and they spawn near areas where we have stormwater outfalls. And so this issue about mixing zones and about dumping stormwater right into spawning habitat is a concern for us. And we uh, basically did what we showed you with exposures to juvenile with her herring embryos and larvae. And, and essentially the, the embryos that are exposed to stormwater and crude oil, either from Exxon Valdez or Deepwater Horizon, they look exactly the same. So the point of that is that there are impacts of stormwater and other species. Um, we're seeing that a paper will be coming out in forage fish, and that that story it looks like oil spill type stuff where pHs are driving it. But again, there's so many compounds in stormwater, and there's so many different species that that that's the context of what's happening with salmon. That's a great answer. Thanks. And uh, it, it is really complex when it comes to stormwater. You can't just look at it and say, yep, that that's the cause. So appreciate the complexity of the issue. Actually, um, and Sarah, I should mention that too. That's why I put that slide up there, because in the beginning, the, the natural resource management framework, particularly around the Clean Water Act, is predicated on developing science to underpin you know, criteria for the protection of aquatic life. And we have sort of left the building on that one. We are in the zone of all these compounds that may be parent compounds, it could be fragments of compounds and metabolites, and almost none of these things have established aquatic life criteria. So, you know, we're operating in a, in a scenario where there's not a lot of regulatory guidance about what to do. Not an easy uh, problem to be working on for sure, but I, I'm really impressed with the work that you are doing. Uh, Jessica, any other follow-up comments, or should we jump on to the next question? Uh, no, and that that covered it very well. I'm fine moving on to the next question. Thank you. Okay, Daniel, what have we got next? I have a question for Jessica from the Washington State Department of Ecology. Uh, Two-parter. First one is related to BIBI and coho as a stream health indicator for your study. Have you seen correlation of coho with MDS1 similar to BIBI with MDS1? In other words, do BIBI and coho respond to the same chemical groups in the same way? And then the second part of that question is, have you screened chemical features of MDS1 in your graph between BIBI and MDS1? I'm curious whether it's only a subset of urban chemicals that you identified from graph one. Jessica, before you jump on that, Daniel, can you do us the favor and drop that into the chat so she can actually see the written words? Oh, <laughs> that was yeah. a lot. We'll, we'll do so. Thanks. 
Jessica, over to you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thank you. I was going to ask for a repeat of the second part of that question. So I'll I'll answer the first part while that this uh, question shows up in the chat. Uh, that's that's a wonderful question. Um, it was beyond the scope of the study to to hone in on the specific chemicals that were uh, we we are relating with the different endpoints that we did look at. Uh, it is a wonderful question and a wonderful. Uh, I, I see the curiosity of if it's similar chemicals that are are um, driving what we're seeing for uh, the BIBI metric and and the and the um, coho mortality metric. Um, I have not run that. I, I am now also curious and will likely do that <laughs> out, out of curiosity to see if it is. I with the nature of the metric now, I don't expect it to uh, to show with with how the analysis analyses are being run because we're not. We're not uh, honing in on specific compounds. The, the index was the correlation of the MDS1 with each of those individual indices was uh, incredibly significant. So to tease out the the specific features that are driving that in with those two different endpoints in question, I don't see that being something we could do with our current data set, likely because of, or, or largely because of sample size. Um, because of how the data is collected, because there's not a, a pairing of, uh, of the macroinvertebrate index being paired with uh, the water sampling where the chemical feature data was from. Um, and similarly with the, the uh, coho prespawn uh, is also not, not exactly paired. Uh, it's from the same watershed and it allows us to do the comparisons we did. Um, at having that as a, a future direction of the study is um, wonderful to have in mind. Um, thank you for thank you for bringing it up. It's it's um it's a really great comment and suggestion. And, and can I add to that real quickly too, Sarah? Yes, of course. Um, so what you know the, this these are data that are going to be forthcoming in, the, in this year, but we think we think there's one or maybe a, just a few compounds in stormwater that are underpinning the coho mortality syndrome. So of the thousands, it's it's a very select group of compounds that we're working on. It's likely um, that that one or more of these compounds is is basically binding to some protein in the salmon body, essentially. And and so one hypothesis, for example, is if you take like hemoglobin, like a, like an oxygen transporting protein, and there's some contaminant in the water that gets into the basically gets across the gill, and it can bind to that protein and bind up those oxygen binding sites and make those unavailable. Then the fish can't transport oxygen from the gill to the tissues, right? So suddenly it starts gaping and surface swimming. It can't get no oxygen, and then it goes through all these cardio respiratory distress symptoms, and then it dies. So that's just a hypothesis that might be wrong. But if it's right, that oxygen binding protein site in fish probably isn't the same as it is in invertebrates. Um, the odds are that it's not. So it's likely that there's going to be a whole bunch of different chemicals and a whole bunch of different mechanisms at play in the whole ecotoxicology of stormwater. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Daniel, how many more questions do we have? And uh, if we have another one, what is it? Uh, yeah, we have three more questions. Um, the next one is from Andrew, uh, representing Clackamas Water Environmental Services. I have a question about the pollutants in the tire wear category. Have the companies who manufacture motor vehicle tires cooperated with your research teams? And have these companies disclosed the names of the chemicals which are used to make tires? So quickly on that, it's a great question. And the, the analytical chemistry component of this is, is, as I mentioned, being spearheaded by UW Tacoma. They're the experts in the civil engineering and they have the instrumentation. They've been working with ecology in Washington State and the green chemistry side of things in particular. And I know that they have also interacted directly with the manufacturers. Um, there's a strong interest in trying to identify what this is and see if there's, you know, economically feasible um, and for product safety, you know, alternatives. That's just a generality for green chemistry overall. It could be tires, it could be anything else. So that conversation about trying to, you know, use adaptive science and feed into um, changes. This happened with us in our work on brake pads a long time ago. So we did a bunch of work on copper toxicity um, and copper and other metals are, are common in vehicle friction brake pads and copper is really toxic to the salmon nose. So in California, Washington, and then you know EPA spearheaded this nationally. There, there was a, a phased a phase out of metals for less toxic substances over time, and so something like that could be down the road. I do know that ecology and and the academic side of the team and the tire manufacturing representatives have been talking. 
I'll just follow up with that real quick as well. Um, there are several representatives from the entire industry that RSVP'd for this STORM seminar. Um, so it is very possible that they are listening into this conversation today. Now, Jessica, if there was interest in becoming more engaged on some of this work, uh, would the Department of Ecology or uh, the university be better contacts or could they get in touch with you as well? Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And and so what you're seeing here are multiple missions. Um, and the our, our mission on the NOAA side of things is is very particular with the species conservation. That's why I spent some time at the beginning, kind of setting up the Endangered Species Act and what we're doing around habitat. Because there will be questions for NOAA that um, they fall into the need to know category versus nice to know category. And so we need to know certain things about what this means for, for you know conservation recovery of our trust resources. That's our mission. That's why we do science. There's a lot of other questions. Uh, related to these compounds that are a little bit more removed, and they would normally be in the purview of EPA or the State's Department of Ecology or DEQ, and uh, and and so that's this breakpoint will probably go down that road for the the primary chemists and the agency leads that are on that, and so we'll probably be uh, we're very curious about that, but we won't be the leaders in that. Understood, and I will make a point that um, the Strategic Stormwater Planning Unit, of which I am a part, has actually worked on questions related to zinc and tires uh, in a prior storms program project. And so we've actually had uh, facilitated meetings in the past related to um, that particular constituent. And we are partnered with our California sister agency, CalRecycle, uh, to look at um, an ongoing study where uh, we look, we'll probably be getting some results on stormwater monitoring work, um, hopefully by the end of the year, but I'm not sure on exact timeline there. So as stated by Nat, there is ongoing collaborative work happening. Um, the chemical profiles associated with tires is not necessarily the, the directed point of conversation at this time, um, but it is definitely something that we're open to have a conversation about. So thank you. Great yeah. question. Well, it's an, it's a good example of, of, and it's a good example of where this, you know, we, our, our motto is to let the fish tell us what's going on with habitats. And so in this particular circumstance, it took 20 years, but the fish were telling us that there was something in stormwater that people weren't paying attention to. And, and that has led us into this whole issue about motor vehicles and, and whatnot. But that's different than a lot of top down sort of this. What is this contaminant? What's it doing to all these different wildlife? We kind of work backwards. Yeah, it's definitely a tricky subject. Um, Daniel, what's the next question that we have on our list? A question from Doug, uh, representing David Evans and Associates. Have you tested any runoff on fish coming out of biofiltration fil facilities, LIDs, to see if they are picking up bad actors? So the, the green infrastructure work that we've published so far um, is basically benchtop analysis, where we're taking uh, relatively polluted stormwater, in this case from the 520 Bridge in Seattle, and running it through different configurations of soil columns. And, and the first generation where we're just a really simple, we're, we're trying to map this onto what the state agencies were recommending that local landowners use. And so this is the 60% sand compost mixture, which is the essentially the most widely used at the time and also the, the most um, arguably inexpensive. So that works really well. And uh, when we take the effluent from what's coming out of those columns, we've done the chemistry, we show good removal for metals, we show good removal for organics. And uh, the fish are telling us that the water quality is a lot better. Um, and we've since been, and Jen's students in particular at WSU have been, have been expand, extending that uh, line of research to look at like multiple water years, how, you know, how, how, how good its installations over time, different soil depths, et cetera, different types of, of soil. We we're actually looking at, at alternatives to compost because compost can leach, leach nutrients. And so um, we have data from benchtop testing to show that the water is clean. We do not have data from a field so Jen's group, and I should be careful about speaking for her, but they they uh, have been working with, for example, the State Department of Transportation, and there are installations along highway roadways to capture runoff and treat it through these bioinfiltration strips. And so there are things like that that are being implemented in the field, and the idea is to get more of our science and these, these particularly these markers that we're developing, uh, operational for deployment and have them be inexpensive so that people have better insights as to, as to how well these local 
innovations are working. And that's, I guess I should say that about green infrastructure, which everybody pretty much knows is that there's no one size fits all. And particularly when you're dealing with urban green infrastructure, the footprint of any given construction site or redevelopment site is totally different. And so there's all kinds of design constraints of what people can do. And you can't do infiltration everywhere. The soils aren't right, et cetera. So in a, we've taken some very small baby steps. We've worked with you know, very conventional soil columns. We show that those work really well, but that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what needs to be done. Fantastic. In terms of that work, Nat, I'm going to do a quick follow-up um, because I could maybe see this teeing up a, a follow-up storms uh, seminar collaboration with NOAA. Um, in terms of that work, ongoing research and next steps, uh, when do you think you might be in a, a good position to maybe come back and talk to us about those efforts? Oh, probably quarterly. Okay, great. Well, we'll put that on the possible roster for, I would say, after the holiday season, but um, let's plan to chat. Uh, next question, Daniel, and how many more do you, we have left in these last 20 minutes of the seminar schedule? Um, including this question, there is one additional question so far. Perfect. Um, let's get to it. Uh, this next question is from Kelly, representing TD Environmental. I was curious if you were able to tell if higher watershed impervious areas with similar traffic levels had any correlation with toxicity, or was the data not sufficient to get to this level of detail? Not sufficient. Okay. And yeah. <laughs> any that, other follow-ups from anyone else? I, I'll just, I'll just, I'll say to that, um, we have been thinking, you know, really carefully about how to how to add more lines of evidence and more confidence. So the city of Seattle, for example, has a vacuum street sweeper system. And so there's been issues about mitigation and, and vacuum sweeping in one watershed and not another and see if that actually helps the coho. There's green infrastructure redevelopment projects that are happening in, in catchments within watersheds. And so could we map onto that, you know? Um, so there's been a lot of good questions about about ways that we could, you know, look at that what's happening on the ground as people are putting in more and more clean water efforts and, and whether that's having a benefit. The major problem that we're having is that, is that the areas that everybody's working in are so heavily urbanized that we have almost no fish. Um, and so the idea is to really get into the urban growth transitional zone where there are still healthy salmon runs and, and there's abundant fish and there's so it happening in real time, not decades ago. So that's really the focus is to try to find the right test beds to look at issues about transportation density and transportation type. And then as a function of what people are doing across what spatial scales to really to get where we need to be. Because as I said before, we don't know how much mitigation is going to be necessary to protect these fish. They're super sensitive to the stormwater. Now, I have a quick follow up question to that, and I think this might also relate to some of Jessica's work. I'm personally curious about some of these different buckets when it comes to urbanization, whether it's low, medium, high, as Jessica's slides indicated, or this highly urbanized versus sort of transitional urbanized that you just described in your last response. Can you give us sort of a picture of what these different thresholds or mixes of land use might look like? Yeah, so our, our premise, you know, when you're looking at those, those, those bins that we have for like 10%, 20%, 30%, you know, predicted mortality or whatever, th those should be taken with a grain of salt. And, and the reason that, that that's one of the reasons that we went back and redid the land use analysis is we wanted to put confidence intervals in those projections. We wanted to say, okay, we think based on land cover that this catchment within this watershed has about a, I don't know, 60% likelihood of mortality and, and it's plus or minus, you know, 10%. And, and that's what we have now. Um, but the, the issue there is that as soon as we do the mapping exercise, right, we're, we're drawing from geospatial data sets that are going to be out of date in a year or two or three. So no, no matter what's happening now, um, it's different from three years ago when we made those maps. So just by virtue of the dynamic nature of population growth and development, um, those, are, those are relatively coarse indicators of the severity, so relatively low risk to coho to relatively high. Uh, the bins themselves, 10 to 20 percent, are probably not that reliable. Um, and again, I would go to that, that 2017 paper from Blake where we really try hard to give that confidence estimate around that. And those changes that we're seeing, they're generally reflective of, uh, of changes in ag and forested land in our areas to uh, residential and urban and ex-urban development. So it's mostly conversion to roads and, and purpose services. And that's another thing that probably didn't come out of the talk with Jessica and her data sets. And you're seeing highly significant relationships between the mortality syndrome or the land use characteristics and like 
indicators of urbanization. They're also negatively correlated with the amount of trees that you have. Deciduous trees showing up because a lot of urban areas, people replace conifers in the Northwest and replant deciduous trees. So deciduous trees are kind of another indicator of an urban gradient. Interesting. You never quite think of what could be an indicator or not, and deciduous trees wouldn't have been on my top list. Interesting. Right. Yeah. Well, we've got about 15 minutes left. Uh, Daniel, did I hear you had one more question for the speakers? Yeah, one more question so far. Uh, this one's for Nat, just a quick clarification. Um, what age were the juvenile steelhead for which you showed results, one or two? Uh, one. And would there be a different age threshold for, I guess, the adult? And this is because I'm not a fish person. <laughs> So we uh, don't know that uh, because we haven't done side-by-side -side testing with coho adults and juveniles, but at least for the the par, right? So these are the, the yearlings or sub-yearlings and then the, the one plus, the bigger ones that we use, and then the adults, those, the, the, the symptomology and the syndrome seems to be the same across all those life stages. And the relative sensitivity uh, is hard for us to gauge because we're doing some exposures with adults and then we use a different storm with juveniles. And so the storms are different. So you can't really say something about their absolute sensitivity, but qualitatively, it doesn't seem like there's any difference across life stages and their vulnerability. I don't know what that's going to mean for steelhead. We're just getting started on steelhead. Understood. And we look forward to hearing more about that information. Uh, Daniel, are there any other questions in the queue or should we do a quick wrap up? Uh, there are no further questions at this time. Perfect. Well, this has been a fantastic conversation and I really enjoyed the presentations by both Nat and Jessica. Thank you so much for joining uh, the California State Water Board on this storm seminar today, uh, especially at 9 a.m. on a Monday morning. Thank you. Um, uh, go ahead. I was saying that it was great. Let's do it again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, thank you. I, we, we appreciate the invite. Yeah, no, um, just I think looking forward ahead to those of you that are hanging in there on the phone. Uh, Storms does host uh, or plans to host regular Storm seminars uh, like this one moving forward. We will be taking a pause uh, for the winter holidays, but we should be back in 2021. And hopefully we will then have sort of some things teed up to work with NOAA, as well as some other possible interesting topics related to possible cost of compliance or stormwater capture use programs um, around California or maybe outside of California with other collaborators. So keep an eye on to our STORMS webpage, uh, join our email list, and um, we really do look forward to hearing uh, from the audience on this and future events. With that, um, it is 1050. We are about 10 minutes early, but I think it's been great, so we can call it. Thank you so much. Thank you all and have a lovely rest of your day. Bye-bye.